It's always lovely to see your, your faces, even the ones that we haven't seen in a while. It's good, it's good to see you here with us and, and enjoying the presence of God. I've, uh, hmm, I love the presence of God. Amen. You know, I was, uh, I was studying, or I wasn't actually studying, I, I, I came across a, an article this morning, and it says that over the last couple decades, last two decades, I reckon it would have, uh, that there has been over 10, 8,000 to 10,000 churches that have shut down in the States. Now, this doesn't include that, uh, this doesn't include the, the ones that have been planted, because obviously the, that's happening on a daily basis as well. But it says that eight to 10,000 churches annually have been shut down in the States over the past two decades. Eight to 10,000, that's 160,000 to 200,000 churches. 160,000 to 200,000 churches. That is, that is maddening. But a church, it seems like in a, in a day when all of hell's breaking loose around us, when there's wars and rumors of wars and, 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 and million different churches all preaching a million different doctrines around us. Where do we go? What do we do? How do we know what the truth is? How do we know what to believe and what not to believe? How do we know what God wants for our lives? I mean, does God want us to prosper? You know, there, there's that prosperity message. Does God want us to prosper? You know, does God, does God want you to be healed? You know, you know, I know God loves me, but, but is it him that put this sickness or disease on me? Or, or does he want to take it away from me? You know, where are we and what are we believing? How do we know what's truth and how, how do we know what isn't? Because I'm telling you, if you don't believe, if you don't believe that God wants to heal you, what are you doing going against his will? Hmm? Because see, we're all seeking after, after the will of God, are we not? And if God's the one that's put these things on us, you know, who are you to go against his sovereign will, what he wants for your life? See, everyone, every person has an innate desire to get healthy when you get sick. Is that, is that, am I right or am I wrong? It doesn't matter if you're a Christian. It doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist. When you get sick, what's the first thing you want to do? I want to get well. And you go by whatever means you can to get there. Whether it means taking a tablet, whether it means going to the doctor, whether it means going to the hospital. But who are you to go against the will of God if you believe he put those things on you? If God's trying to teach us something in our sickness and disease, who are we to go against that? How do we know what the truth is? How do we know what the truth is? Well, I'll tell you a little, a little secret. That shouldn't be a secret at all. You know, God gave us this. He gave us this word. See this nice, beautiful new Bible I have. But he gave this to each and every one of us. And it's not just a history lesson. It's not just a, a historical data of all of our family, which it is. But that's not just what it is. It's a 66-book love letter written to you. Why? So you know the heart of God. You know exactly what God thinks, exactly what he wants, exactly who he is. And being made in his like, image and likeness, then you can find out who you are. You can find out what he wants for you, what he needs for you, what he desires for each and every one of you. But it's found in here. It's found in here. It's not, it's not found on YouTube, church. See, all of us, we want, we want to get, oh, I just don't read good. I need to, I need to listen to more. I need, you know, what you need to do is get in the Word. This is where our foundation needs to be. And you can supplement it with preachers. You can supplement it with books, right? But this book, this is the book. This is the Word of God. This is what we need to be in on a daily basis. Then we won't we'll stop getting confused about all the crazy doctrines that are going on around there. You say, well, well, pastor, if God would just speak to me and tell me these things, I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to, uh, I, I'd know what to do. Get in the word. Get in the word. That's the number one way God is going to speak to each and every one of us. That's the number one way God's going to speak to you. Can I get an amen? amen? 
That's the number one way God is going to speak to you is through this word. Yeah, and, and James, you don't need to flip there. When I was, uh, when I was uh, well, you can if you like, but it's just going to be one verse I'm going to talk about here. In James 1, verse 27, I was, you know, when I was, uh, me and my wife, we got married, I, I think I was about 23 years old, and uh, we didn't ha- start having children until I think I was 29 years old. And by that time, you know, business was coming on, you know, you know, I'm starting to do things in the ministry, things, you know, a lot of changes now. And, I, and I, was, I was getting to be super busy. And she started asking, you know, you want, you, are you ready to have kids? I was like, no, I, I, don't, I don't really know if I want to, but see, we agreed, you know, before we got married that we both wanted two kids. Right. So, so I was like, you yeah, know, yeah, okay, well, yeah, we'll, we'll have one, you know, we'll, 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 we'll be able to, I'll be able to manage this. And, and God blessed us with a, with a beautiful boy. His name's Lane, a little quiet one. And then a couple years rolled by, and, and she says, well, are you want you, you know, what do you think? You'd like to have another kid? I said, no. No, I, I, we got the perfect one. Why do, why do we need another? You know, I don't even know if I could love another one as much as I love this one. I don't know, you know. And so what happens? We have another child. God blessed us with another child, Jedediah Gideon. And another two or three years, you know, go by, and, and Kimberly, she's always talked about adoption. She's always talked about it. And a couple years go by, she goes, well, hey, Ryan, what do you, what do you think about uh, adopting? I said, I don't think about it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing for people, but I don't think it's a good thing for me, for us, for our family, you know. I'd say, she goes, well, well, why don't you pray about it? I was like, yeah, okay. Okay. So about six months rolls by, right? She says, well, what's God been speaking to you? I thought, what? Well, what's God been speaking to you about adoption? I said, he hasn't. She said, he hadn't spoke to you about it? And I said, no. She goes, well, have you prayed about it? And I said, no. <laughs> I sure haven't. Well, why? Because I knew what the right answer was. I knew what, I knew what, what God would want. I wasn't going to say, well, God told me to do this. Then you got to do it, right? So I was like, no, I, I haven't prayed about it. She was like, well, well will, you, will, you, will you see what God's will is on that? I said, yeah. Yes, I will pray. I will pray about it. So I said, I went in, started praying about it, and I got into the Word, right? I got into the Word. As I was reading, there's this verse, and I, I always title it in my Bible as my Lucy verse. As I was studying through it, this, this uh, James chapter 1, verse 27 just jumped up off the page and like had fireworks going on around it as I was reading to it. And like literally like it was speaking to me, like it was reading me. I wasn't reading it. And we've all probably read it a million times. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know, I, I, I read that just as probably most of us have many times. I said, well, oh, I mean, that's pretty simple. It means we need to go visit them, right? You can go visit, go say hello to orphans, or if you see them on the street, say hello, maybe, maybe give them a euro or two. You know, you go, go visit the widows, you know, make them, make them feel like they're loved. You know, that's what that means. But, that's, you know, but the Lord wanted me to look a little deeper into what the word visit means. Now, when, now in visit, when it's translated from the Greek, it does mean to, uh, to go see or to visit, but, but it also means to relieve or look out. You know, when God showed that to me, he's like, he's like, so what am I actually trying to tell you to do? He says, to go relieve and look after the fatherless and the widows and their affliction. And their affliction, I need you to go relieve them of that affliction. To look after them in that affliction. And I was like, okay, God. Okay, would well, change my heart on this matter, right? Change my heart on it. And, all you get, and when you start yielding to the things of God, yielding to the word, Yielding to, to what the Holy Ghost is trying to tell you, he'll change your heart. Why? Because he has changed you on the inside of you. Amen. But I'm telling you, if I was not in the word, I don't know if I would have ever got my Lucy verse, right? My Lucy verse is what that's called. Why? Because that's when God spoke to me about adopting that beautiful little Chinese girl back there. And I never knew that I could love a third as much as I love the first and the second. Never knew that was possible. But God's good. God is good. You say, well, 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 Pastor, I, I study the word and, and, and what about all these other ways? Well, God, speak, God will speak to us in other ways as well. 
You know, we've talked about it several months back about, you know, God will speak to us in the inward witness. What is, what is that? That's, a, that's like a, a rope kind of tied around you, just gently nudging you in the right direction, right? Just have a gent nudge in the right direction. Not, not a pulling, not a pushing, but a nudging, something you can pull against. You can, you can, you can make your own decisions, but it's a gentle nudge. He also speaks to us through the, through the still, small voice, Right? The still small voice, the, the, that, that still small voice that's on the inside of each and every one of us, right? Which the more you get in the word and the more you spend time in prayer, you'll be able to decipher that still small voice on the inside of you than the, than the, than the voice that's in your head. Because you've got two voices that will be speaking to you. One is that still small voice. It's your spirit. It speaks right from the bottom. And it comes up and it's nice, it's gentle, and it's simple, you say, well, well, what is that? It's your spirit speaking to you. You know, the world will call it your conscience. You know, have you ever been walking around and you're like, well, I'd take a left here. You hit just something in your gut. And, you know, people say, oh, my gut told me this. That, that, that is your spirit speaking to you, telling you to go right or left, to back up, to move forward. Do whatever it may be, that's your spirit. You say, well, can my spirit be trusted? Can my conscience be trusted? Well, if you've been reborn, it can definitely be trusted. Why? Because it's been anointed and sealed by the Holy Ghost. But prior to getting reborn, prior to receiving the Holy Ghost, I wouldn't trust my, my spirit for anything. Well, I was full of iniquity, right? But see, as, as reborn children, we can, we can learn to yield and listen to that voice and, and start, start going. Why? Because it, it's in constant communion with the Holy Ghost. It, your spirit's not going to lead you in a wrong path. It's going to lead you only into paths of righteousness. Why? Because it's, it's anointed and sealed in, in complete communion with the Holy Ghost. We need to watch our minds. Your minds will lead you in a different direction. That's why we need to be renewing them on a daily basis, right? Say, well, will God actually just speak to us? Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll speak to us. It's called the authoritative voice of the Holy Ghost. He will speak out loud. It's not actually out loud. It's just speaking to your spirit, but it'll see, seem so powerful that, that he'll speak to you. But, but it's the, the rarest way God will ever speak to you. Why? Because he doesn't want us to command us in everything we're doing. He wants us to be children of faith. He wants us to, be, to live in his word, trust in his word, and be led by what he has for us. Out of every method there is that God will speak to us. That is the minimum, the maximum, is the word. But God, in any of all four of those, will never speak outside of his word. He'll never go outside of Revelation. He'll never go outside of Genesis. He'll always be right down the middle, speaking, speaking in the middle of, uh, of the word. Amen? Now, God, in his mercy, in his goodness, in his love and kindness, he gave, us, he gave us this word. He gave us the word of God to guide us and direct us and, 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 and to know who he is. Now, I don't know about you, but there's, there's several, several ministers that I've listened to in the past that, that have kind of gotten disturbing to me here of late because they, they, put, such a, they put such a twist on, on, the, on the word of God to where, to where you get statements like this. Well, you got you to have at least one scripture but to have a, an actual official service. Belittling the things of God, belittling the word of God. And they use this as an excuse. Well, the apostles didn't, didn't, didn't have this word, so why, why should we have to preach in this direction all the time? Why should we have to, have to be, you know, in the boundaries of this word because the apostles didn't have it? Well, if you study the word of God, the, the apostles did have it. What were they quoting? They were quoting the Old Testament nonstop throughout the word from Jesus all the way into Revelations. They, they were quoting and preaching the word of God from the Old Testament. Now, that Old Testament was written for us, right? But then God provided us through these apostles, through the foundation of the church. He has provided us with his word to lead us and guide us, direct us for the epistles, for the gospels and the epistles, because they're written to you. They're not written for you. They're, they're written to us as the church. Amen? Now, I love the prophetic things, church. We, we have it often in this house. I love God. What is the, what is prophe pro the prophetic? It is God speaking to his people. And I, and I love it. I love when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, but, but it, can, 
in no way belittle the word of God or the things of God. The God, you know, the, the, the word is what keeps us in our boundary in all things we've done. Like I've told you, you guys several times, well, well, if God is speaking to you through a person, if a person gives you a word, if he gives you, if a, if a man by the Holy Ghost gives any prophetic message to you, it has to line up with two things. It has to line up with the word of God. And it has to line up with the spirit that's on the inside of you. If it doesn't line up with, with both of those things, you need to kick it to the curb. It's not of God. That's how we decipher between the intelligence of man and the things that man wants for people. And we decipher if it's really God speaking to us. Why? It has to be in the middle. It has to be right in the word of God, in between Genesis and Revelations. And it has to give you the green light on the inside. Well, how do I know if I'm getting that green light? You need to start spending time with the Lord. You need to start spending time in the word. Amen. So that's how we get led in all these crazy different directions because we don't know the word. We have to know the word of God if we're going to know if he's actually speaking to us or if it is an angel masquerading as an angel of light coming and speaking to you, getting you off path, getting you, getting you going in a, in a wild and, and different direction. Amen? But I tell you, church, if you will, if you will dig into this, this little jewel that God's given you, if you'll dig into it, you're going to find out that that sickness, that poverty, that bondage, that death, that all these things that are, are a negative environment of us were all from the curse. Who provided us with the curse? Not God. Not God. And our choice... And our choice, we received the curse from the adversary, but it was our choice. You say, well, how was that in Deuteronomy 30, 19? He's, the Lord himself says, I call heaven and earth into account. Yeah, I, call, I call heaven and earth as a witness unto you. Right? That I place before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose. Therefore, choose. Therefore, choose. Choose life. He said, I, I, I love you so much, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put everything out in front of you. Do you know where death is? You know where life is. You know where the curse is? You know where blessing is. But it's your job, it's your job, it's not my job, it's your job to choose it. You're going to have to choose it. Now what is death talking about in the Word? Death's not talking about you're going to fall over and die. It's talking about a separation from God. So it's in, I, I've, I've, I'm showing you how to be in communion with me, and I'm showing you how to be, you know, how to be distant from me, not be able to hear from me, not, not be able to live in the, in, the, in, the, in the blessings that I have for you. But it's all a choice. It's all a choice that, that you made. But in God's love and in his mercy that he has for each and every one of us, what do you do? He provided us with his word, knowing that we have iniquity, knowing that, that prior to Jesus coming down and giving us the victory, that we'd have a way to walk in the fullness of what God had for us. Amen? I like an old preacher friend of mine used to say this when talking about mercy and talking about grace. He says, you know, grace is, the, grace is God giving you something you don't deserve, but mercy is, is God not giving you something you do deserve. And it's simplicity. It's so powerful. Right? Grace is giving you, giving you something you don't deserve. It's empowering you, giving you God's ability. It's giving you something that you, that you can't do anything to deserve it. Right? And mercy is God not giving you something you do deserve. See, how many of you know that, well, I'll say this. How many of you know I was a person that deserved to be separated from God? Amen? Why? Because I walked in iniquity. I walked in sin. I was proud of the sin that was in my life. I, I walked separated from the things of God. I deserved hell. I deserved sickness. I deserve all these things because it's, it's the path I chose. I, I wasn't choosing him. I chose my path, the world's path. Amen? And I deserve that. But in his goodness, oh, can someone say, thank God for his mercy? Thank God for his mercy he provided for us. Romans 5 eight. while we were yet still sinners, while I was yet a still sinner, you know, God sent his son to die for us. He didn't, he didn't make sure I had, to, I had to clean up things first. He didn't, he didn't make sure that I, that I had this I dotted, this T crossed. No, no, in the midst of all of my rebellion against him, he sent Christ to die for us, for each and every one of us. But as great as God's mercy is, 
as great and as powerful and profound and how blessed we are to have his mercy in our lives, there comes a point in time where God desires us to become more like him. To be matured up and be more like him. You say, what do I mean by that, Pastor? Through your ignorance, through our ignorance. Now, ignorance is not a, is not a bad word. It just means lacking knowledge. Right? So through our lacking knowledge, God has, has, has yeah, allowed his mercy to go forth. He's, he's on to work on our behalf. And, but there comes a time where he desires for us to be trained up to be children of faith. To be children like our daddy. To walk in faith. You say, well, how, how does that work? Well, well, how many of you, when you were first saved, or first started healing, uh, hearing a little bit about healing and stuff, it was so easy for you to get healed. Right? In our ignorance, he provided a way. You could come up and you can get you can get prayed over. It doesn't matter if you had if you had just a cold, it got healed. It didn't matter if cancer came upon you, it disappeared. It didn't matter if you had a, a financial need, God met it instantly. All these things happened and it happened quickly. Happened like just like the snap of your finger. Why? Most of the time, because you're, you're relying on my faith, or you're relying on the faith of the minister that was ministering to you, or you're relying on the gifts of the Spirit to, to be in operation. But in our ignorance, God had mercy on us. And he goes, yeah, I love you so much. Yes, I want you to be healed. Yes, I want you to be prosperous. Yes, I want these great things to happen. Yes, I want you to have peace. I want all these great things to happen for you. But, but, but just like any good father, just like any good dad does, he desires us to begin to be built up to be able to stand on our own two feet to where you don't have to rely on one person or another, but, but you can start relying on who he is and who his word is. So you, you start come, people start coming up like, well, oh man, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. You know, pastor, you prayed for me for like, like 10 times now and it hadn't manifested in my life. Well, I'm telling you, there's a reason for it. God's trying to train you up. He's trying to, she's trying to begin to, to get you to operate not off of my faith, not of a, a gift of the spirit of healing being an operation, but being a faith child. The operating in the faith that, that he's placed on the inside of you. You know, people say, well, Pastor, I just don't have the faith that you have. I don't have the faith that you have. I say, yes, you do. Watch your words. Yes, you do. You have the exact faith that I have. We all have the same measure of faith, church. We all have the same measure of faith. Now, may, mine may be a little bit stronger, it may, be, it may be exercised a little bit more, but we all have the same measure. I, I, I started jogging here recently, and there's this little two-mile little path out, out in, in the middle of nowhere where we live that, that I started jogging. And, and I, can, I can go one mile and, and jog full you know, for one mile, and then the next mile I, I jog and I walk. Now, I didn't go out there just thinking, you know, I'm going to go out there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run five miles, and I'm, I'm going to be able to handle it. You know? Now, I got pretty sore after I, wore, after, after I even jogged that first mile, right? Why? Because you got to ex- I got to exercise these muscles. I got I got to get them into the into the position where they can they can be endurance like and they can they can withstand the power of 200 pounds, you know, sitting on top of them being running, right? It's the same way with our faith. See, you can have faith and you can just sit there idle and do nothing for you. But see, if you start exercising your faith, you start believing God for something, it starts getting stronger. It starts getting stronger and it starts getting stronger and it starts getting stronger. Why? Because God begins to answer those things and we start standing in faith in what the word has to say for you. And it, nothing will build faith of seeing God, God perform on your behalf, bring things to pass in your life through you believing God for it. Through you doing it. No one else but you standing in faith, seeing what God will do for you. Amen? So what do you believe in God for? Most people ask that question like, oh, I don't know. I'm not believing God for it. I don't know. Church, you need to be exercising your faith. You need to be exercising your faith. Well, what do I believe God for? I don't know what's on your heart. Have you ever searched the, the hidden man in your heart and see what, what, see what the desires are on the inside of you? Are you believing for healing for, for the person down the street? Are you believing for healing for that relative? Start standing in faith for it. Are you believing for people to get saved? Start standing in faith for it. Are you believing for university for your children? Start, start standing in faith for it. Are you believing for finances that come in your life? Start standing in faith for it. Are you believing for healing in your body? Start standing in faith for it. Don't expect someone else to stand in faith for you. You do it. 
Grab a hold of the word of God and start standing in faith for what he has for you. And allow it to be birthed. Jesus is looking for people that, that want him to be birthed in their lives, to be a witness to anybody and everyone around them. So, what, so how are you receiving from God? Let me, let me ask you that question. How do you receive from God? Are you, are, you, are you receiving saying, oh, man, I hope, I hope Pastor hadn't lost it? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you something on that. There's a, uh, there's a story of Brother Hagin. And uh, that, that Brother Hagen likes to tell, and I, hopefully I don't butcher it too bad here, but, but uh, there was this man that had like, a, like some, something like cancer or something like that on his body, and, and the doctors couldn't do anything about it. And, and, and there was a, he wasn't a Christian, but you know, this healing evangelist or this evangelist that had a healing ministry was coming through town back in the States. And, and uh, some of his buddies were like, you know, Everywhere this guy goes, there's all kinds of people getting healed. Why don't you go, why don't you go uh, uh, check it out? So he went to the meeting, walked up there, and what happened? Guy laid his hands on him. You know, he instantly got healed, got, got, got reborn, got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and, and his life was forever changed, right? Well, well uh, a few years passed by, and the guy ended up getting a, a double hernia. And, and his, you know, double hernia, I guess, in this, in this region here. And he went up, that, that same healing evangelist, or the evangelist that had a healing ministry was coming through town. And he goes, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just go, I'll just go get what that, that guy had and again, you know? So he walked up, got hands on him, nothing happened. He was like, oh, man, I can't believe that guy lost it. Man, he had, he had a lot of power in him before, but he lost it this time, you know? You know, here comes Catherine Kuhlman running through town. Oh, yeah, she has it now. I hear she has it. Let me, let me see what she had. Hands on nothing like, oh, well, well, she must have lost it too. I don't know what's going on in the church. I'm going to go out. Maybe Amos something with Pearson has. I'm going to take a trip on out to California, see, see if I can get hands laid on me there, see what would happen. Hands got laid on them, nothing happened. Oh, well, she lost it too. You know, all these evangelists that had, that, that, that healing was associated with their ministries that were all laying hands on this guy and nothing happened. Well, well Brother Hagen ro- rolls through town, right? And as he rolls up to get prayed for by Brother Hagen, Brother Hagen, you know, says, well, what can I pray for you for? Well, well, I had this double hernia, and I'm, you know, I've got my hands laid on me by all these people, and I just, they, they've all lost it. You know, do you, do you still have it? And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to pray for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go sit down in your seat, right? And you listen to me. In the morning and the evening services for the next two weeks, I think there's a week and a half left. For the next week and a half, you, you listen to, my, to my, these services in the morning and the evening, and then, and then come talk to me after the end of the, after the, end of the final service, and, and God's going to heal you. He goes, okay. So he goes, I paid attention. I was watching. And he, he was sitting there. He was sitting there taking notes every morning and every evening, every morning and every evening. Well, the last day rolls around, and, and he comes up with a big smile on his face, and Brother Hagen says, well, well, you, are you coming to get healed today? He said, he said, Brother Hagen, I'm already healed. All I need you to do is just put your hands on me, and I'm going to be healed. But Brother Hagen put his hands on him, and he was healed instantly. Why? Because God was training him up. He was training him up to receive by faith and not off of someone else's ministry. So I say, how are you receiving? Is it, has Pastor Ryan lost it? I've never had it. Never had it. I can't heal anything. I've had a cold. I've tried to heal it. It won't do anything. But I'm telling you, there is a power of God that lives on the inside of us that, that will heal people. But it's not just living on the inside of me. It lives upon the inside of each and every one of us. It lives on the inside of each and every one of us. So how are, you, how are you coming to receive? See, maybe this is why God didn't want me to pray for people at the beginning of the service today. Because how, how, how are you coming to receive? Are you just looking, looking, hoping, hoping, God, are you, are you watching as I'm getting prayed over this time? Are you going to reach your hand down this one time and touch me? How are you coming to receive? Are you coming with full faith knowing Knowing that God is our healer, that he is our deliverer. Knowing that these things have already been taking place on the inside of you. I'm telling you, church, that's why it's a dangerous place to be in a church like this. Right? See, you're held accountable for the things you know. And I'm going to be teaching you faith. I'm going to be teaching you faith. I'm going to be teaching you faith. I'm going to teach you how to receive from God. I'm going to teach you how to stand on your own two feet. But you're going to have to be responsible for it. 
You're going to be responsible for it. Now, that's not, a, that's not a scary place to be. That's a wonderful place to be. That's a wonderful place to be. That's how you're going to be able to minister these things to other people. Why? Because you're going to have the own proof of it working in your own lives. Amen? Now, let's go to John chapter 5. Oh, opened right there. Praise the Lord. In John chapter 5. Now, this is one of the greatest examples I, I know in the word that, that actually has the mercy of God and the faith working side by side in, in, the, in the same story here. And in verse 1 it says, And after, after there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, he goes now there in at Jerusalem by the sheep's market pool, which was called in Hebrew Beth, uh, 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 Bethesda, having five porches. Now, now, kind of get you uh, to understand what this is talking about here. You know, in, in one of the outer courts there, it was a, it was a, you know, it was like in the shape of a square, and there was a roof going around it that was in the shape of a square with little columns going around the whole roof, right? So, so they're standing underneath this this roof, and there's columns all around it, and there was this pool sitting there. This pool was called Bethesda. Now, this pool had, had five porches going around it. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is by the, the sheep's gate, right? So you see that, that where these sheeps are going through, getting ready to go to, to be sacrificed, they're coming right by this place called Bethesda, which is, which is a pool. Now, what does Bethesda mean? See, everything, everything in the Word has a meaning, Right? You can do a little bit of digging and find out what the meaning of, of any and everything is in the world. So what, so what is Bethesda? Well, in the, in the Hebrew, it means the house of loving kindness. But in the Aramaic, which what they spoke that day, it means the, it means the house of mercy. So most people know it as the house of mercy. So, they, so this pool is the pool of the house of mercy. Isn't, isn't that amazing that, that people would go to this, to this house of mercy to receive something from God? Well, what were they relying on? Relying on the mercy of God, weren't they? They're relying on the mercy of God. Very similar to the way people, very similar to the way people act in church nowadays. Still rely on the mercy of God. Thank God for His mercy. I'm thankful for it. But we ought not to be relying on God's mercy on a on a 24 hour stance, if you will. Amen. See what we call it now, or what I call it is a firehouse, right? But they were calling it as a house of mercy. You say, well, why do I call it a firehouse? Because the church is just like this, just like it was back, back in these days. We don't, we don't, people don't change. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to see. What happens? We go about doing our own business. Oh, do you love God? Oh, I love God. You know, I don't, I don't go to church. I don't do anything else. But, 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 I, lo- but I love God. I don't, I don't sow into mission. But I, but I love God. And I go out doing my own business, taking care of whatever I believe to take care of. And, and what happens? What happens as a Christian? How I many you know you got a big target on your back as a Christian, right? Why? Because Satan hates you. He hates you. Why? Because you represent Jesus. You represent God. You are made in his likeness and image. And if you're a Christian, you're representing his defeat. You're representing the victory that Jesus has made for you. So why, why does he hate you? Because you, you, you're witnessing, you're proclaiming his defeat. So anytime he can, any opportunity he can, he's going to come after you. He's going to come steal everything you got if, he, if you allow it. He's going to come put all kinds of sickness and disease on you if you allow it. And he will try to murder you if you allow it. Because the thief come not but to kill and to steal and destroy. Him and all his false messengers. All they want to do is kill, steal, and destroy. So what happens? They, they, they go out there, they, they end up something... Uh, they get some sickness, what do they do? They, come to, they call they call a 9999, right? Oh, come put out my fire. Come put out my fire. I need, I need healing. Come put out my fire. Get, they, you know, you have some financial need in your life. What happens? You call 999. Oh, come put out the fire. I need, I need something to help put out my fire. You got marital problems. What happens? I'm, uh, 999, I need someone to come put out my fire. And God's so faithful in his mercy, he does. What does he do? He continues to preach the word of God and teach the word of God and preach the word of God and teach the word of God. And what happens? The word says that, that uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We start grabbing a hold of the word of God. We end up getting healed of our diseases. We start getting prosperous in everything we do. Our marriages start going back in the right direction again. And then what happens? They leave. They leave. And then guess what happens? Several months later, they're going to be calling 999 again. 
999, I need the fire put out again. I need it, I need it put out again. That's why it's so important for you to get planted, church. Yeah. So important for you to get planted so you can get some preventive maintenance going on in your life to where when the fire comes, you already got the fire extinguisher saying, Shh, no devil, I don't think so, ain't happening here. I don't receive that. And go on about your business. It's not, it's not a big task that has to, be, that has to take place that you need to have the, to be equipped to deal with the things that are going to come against you. Amen? In verse 3 it says, And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, and waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down in a certain place into the pool and troubled the water that whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Church, this is the, the greatest example of mercy. If you can ever see it in the Word, this is like one of the greatest examples of mercy. One of the greatest examples in our, in our ignorance of how to, how to get healed, even in our rebellion against the things of God, what did he do? He provided this, this pool in the house of mercy that an angel would come down an angel in heaven would come down and stir this pool, stir it up just a little bit. And the first person that saw it and that was able to jump in that water got, got healed of, of whatever disease. It didn't matter if they had the cold or flu or they had limbs missing. Whatever it was, it got healed. They were made whole. They were made whole of it. Amen? Oh, how set up. This is not a legend. Amen? This is not a legend and it's not a parable. You say, well, how do you know it's not a parable? Because I'm not that stupid. <laughs> Amen? Because it doesn't say that it is a parable. It doesn't say that it was likened unto. It says, an angel from heaven comes down and stirs this pool. Why? It's showing the goodness and the kindness and the loving mercy of our Father. That even when you are in rebellion, even, even when you're doing stupid things in your life, he, he provided a way for these people to get healed. It's a simple it's as simple as that. You say, well, <laughs> oh, Lord, I don't want to go there. Uh -oh. Yeah. Well, anyhow, you say, you say well, this isn't, this isn't fair. This isn't fair because why, why can only the first person that gets in the water get healed? That's not fair. Who are we, you know, how, how, how could God, he, God's not a fair and just God. Who are you to question the sovereignty of, of a loving father? Who are you to question God? Who are you to question his goodness? Who are you to question his mercy? God didn't have to do this, guys. See, he had provision in his law. It says, you know, if you, if you follow these things, you're going to walk in health and you're going to be provided for and you're going to be prosperous your whole life and you're going to have a long life. But if you don't do these things, you open yourself up for the adversary and he's going to bring hell in your life, right? See, in his goodness, he goes, man, I know, I know, I know my children. I know, I know the way they think. I know, I know they still have iniquity in them. I know, I know some of these things. So I'm, I'm going to set up this pool. And in my goodness, in my mercy, you know, the, the first person that gets in there gets healed. Is that, is that not fair? Is that not just? You know, Jesus asked the same question when, the, when he talked about the laborers going out and, and, and working in the fields. And the, and the last one that only worked an hour made the same wage as the one that worked a full day, 12 hours or whatever it might be. He says, am, am I evil because I choose to do good? Is, he, is God evil because he decided to pay the, the last one the same as the first? Is God evil because he decided to put out mercy for someone to get in this pool instead of, instead of healing them all? Hmm? Well, come on, church. He's a good father. We need to change the way we think about God. He's not doing things to harm us. He's not doing things to segregate. He, he does everything in his power to make a way for us. But we got to come into that place in our own insecurities. We've made judgments that have allowed us not to receive the things of God because we've, we've decided in our own intellect what we think is right and what's not right. We don't make that call. He does. He does. It says, And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that how long he's, that he'd been there, he said, he said to him, well, Will you be made whole? Will you be made whole? Why didn't Jesus, why didn't Jesus go to, to all the people and, and start preaching to them all? 
Is that, is that fair? It's not about all the other people. It's not about being fair. Why did Jesus go to this one man? Because he saw something in him. What did Jesus say? I don't ever do anything I don't see the Father do, and I don't say anything I don't hear my Father say. So what did he do? He went up to this one. What, what did he see in him? Yes, he said, do you have faith? that it's even possible still to get healed. Will you be made whole? Do you, do you have that faith to receive what I have for you? Hmm. You know, if you, if you can sit here and look at this, instead of questioning God on his mercifulness or not, you can get to the, you can get to the point in seeing that Jesus is actually trying to tell us two things in the scripture. The first one is, is God has compassion upon us all. He has compassion upon all people. You say, well, how do I know that he has compassion upon all people? If you look in, in, in verse 14, you'll see that this guy was a sinner. He was a sinner, right? And the Amplified, it says, and after Jesus found this man in the temple, after he, after he healed him, he said, oh, so you're a well. Stop sinning or something worse is going to come upon you. Hmm? See, Jesus knew who this guy was. He knew the sin that he was, that he was mixed up in. Probably for 40 years, this guy's been mixed up in it. And he, he still picked him out of the crowd. Why? Because he had faith to receive from God, right? Hmm? Sitting right next to, to the mercy pool. But he didn't say, continue on about your business. I mean, I know when God changes us from the inside out, he wants to make you new. Right? He wants us to change. He wants a nature change on the inside of you. Now, he'll, he'll heal us. He'll benefit us. He'll do a lot of great things for us, but he does not desire us for to, to stay the same as we came. He'll take us the way we are, but he desires us to change, to make an inward change on the inside of us. Why? Because something worse may come upon you. Jesus isn't saying, I'm going to give you something worse. He's saying the adversary can bring you something worse if you allow it. If you allow it, the, the adversary, if you don't change your ways, allow it and uh, you allow the adversary to come against you, right? In Matthew 12, what did Jesus talk about there? He talked about, you know, you cast a demon out of a person, the, that unclean spirit goes out into all the dry places and searches all the things, and, and after we can't find a place to live, what does he say? I'm gonna go back to where, I'm gonna go back to where I came out of, and I'm not going back by myself. I'm gonna take seven more wicked demon, unclean spirits than myself. And what happens? The man was worse off than he was before, Right? Hmm. So Jesus isn't going to do anything to you, but we can open up the door for and allow the adversary to bring all kinds of hell and havoc in our lives. Now, now the second thing Jesus was trying to point out, if you can believe God for anything, anything will be possible for you. We just spent a month and a half, two months talking about that. If you can believe God, anything and everything is possible for you. So Jesus asked, are you, are you willing to made whole? Do you still have faith to be made whole? And the impotent, impotent man answered him, since sir, he says, I have no man in the, uh, when, the, when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steps in. And Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. And he took up his bed and walked on the same day of the Sabbath. He, he says, immediately he was healed. Now, a key we need, to, we need to pay attention to here is, is God will give you the opportunity. If we can just get our eyes off of everything that's going on around us. See, see this guy was trying to play the... The, uh, the, the poor me, the poor me card, right? Oh, I just can't get healed. I just can't get, I just can't get in the pool quick enough because I'm crippled and, and no, one's, no one's here to help me. My family's left me, my friends have left me and I can't get in. You know, poor woe is me, woe is me. I've been prayed for five times and it, and it hadn't, and it, and I haven't gotten healed. That preacher must have lost it. Poor woe is me, woe is me, right? Woe is me. But see, if we can get our eyes, if we can get our eyes off of us, our eyes off the circumstances, our eyes off the things going on around us and listen to what Jesus has to say and act on the faith that he's trying to spark on the inside of us, you, you'll, get, you'll receive exactly what God is saying for you. So Jesus, what did he say? He didn't say, well, well uh, brother, hopefully someone can help you get into the pool. He didn't say that, did he? No, he said, he said take up your mat and walk. Now, see, he could have said, well, how am I going to take up my mat and walk? Hey, don't, you, don't you see I'm a cripple, Jesus? That's why I've been sitting here for 38 years. Don't you see this? Hmm? Don't you see this? But what did he do? He stood up. He stood up and acted on the faith that Jesus made possible for him. What are you standing on today? 
How are you going to receive from God? How are you desiring to receive from God? Are you desiring to, to wait on his mercy to come forth? For God's merciful. But God also says in his word that, that I'll, I show mercy on who I choose, right? On who he chooses. Not who we choose, on who he chooses. Why? But he's given us the ability, he's given us a measure of faith that we can receive anything we need at any time, at any place, anything, any desire that we have. Now, for whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, if you believe that you can receive it, it will be made known. It will be made good to you. Um, will you, will you go get them back there, Just. But as, so as, we, as we're talking today, as we're fixing to take communion, it is the, is the, uh, the, last, the last Sunday of the week. I, I want you to come in this time of communion in faith for what God can do for you. For this is, this is, this is an important, I mean, it is an important day that we, that, we, that we come together as a church family. It's, a, it's an, an important ordinance of the church. Now, now I see that we have some people here that, that, that may not come here all the time. You say, well, well, who's able to take communion? Do I have to be part of a de- denomination? Do I, 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 it doesn't matter if you're Catholic. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist. It doesn't matter if you're Methodist. It doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal or non-denominational. None of these things matter. What is the prerequisite to be able to take communion? You need to be a believer. You need to be a believer in the things of God. You need to be a believer of the things of God. And then you can, then you are able to partake. You're able to partake in what God has for us. So in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I have received of the Lord... That which also delivered unto you that the, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also he took the cup after he had supped or after he had ate. And he said, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. You can go ahead. He goes in verse 26 For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Now, what does this, this word shoe mean? S H E W. You know, it's, it's like to, to, to show forth, right? If you, if you go back and look this, this word up in the Greek, it says it means to proclaim, to preach, to declare openly, or celebrate. That's what we're doing today. This is, this is what we do as the body of Christ. We are, we are coming together to preach, to proclaim, to declare openly, and to celebrate. To celebrate what? The Lord's death till he comes. How many of y'all know that Jesus is coming? He's on his way back, but he's, he's waiting for a great revival to come take place where he can come up and snatch up his kids off of this earth and come down and set forth his throne here in this land. He's coming back, but what are we doing with communion? We're celebrating, we're proclaiming his death. His death, his death, his burial, and his resurrection until he comes and he gets to sit up here and preach this sermon. these powerful words coming out of Jesus' mouth. Mm. You say, well, what are we, well, what are we proclaiming? What happened in, in this death? It was the great exchange, the greatest exchange that's ever taken place here on this earth. So as we've talked about, so you can receive things by mercy. But I want to ask you guys, what are you believing God for? What do you believe in God in your life for today? Do you need healing in your body? Do you need a permanent job? Do you need, do you need something for your children or you need finance? What, what are you believing for? You see, we can, we can receive from God in this time right now. See, this, this is what he says. We, we're here to proclaim. We're here and we're preaching. We are declaring openly and celebrating his death. What happened in his death? The greatest exchange that mankind has ever seen. He took our sin. 
so that we can pay, be made righteous. For, for he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made, that I may be made, that, that, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But, it, but he didn't just stop there. Church, he took our poverty so that we could be made rich. Why? Because he, he has a great plan for you. He wants you to prosper. He wants, you, wants great things for you. He, he needs money in his church so we can perform the things that he asked us to do. His word says that, that for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. So that through his poverty, we might be made rich. His church, his children, the Father's children might be made, be abundantly supplied in everything they do. But he didn't stop there. He took your curse so that you could be blessed. So each and every one of you could be blessed for you, for Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed that any man who hangs up upon a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Through him taking our curse, we, we get to have the Holy Ghost. We get to be part of, of the nations that was prophesied even to, even to Abraham as we're one of those stars that are in the sky. We're one of the, the bits of sand that are on the seashore. We are, we are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. We are the first and we're not the last. We are the lenderer and not the borrower. But he didn't stop with that. He took your sickness. He took the curse of sickness and disease that Satan had the right to put on the people of rebellion. And he made us able to walk in divine health. Not that we had to fall the, the letter of the law to a T. But all we had to do is receive him and he, and he gave us the grace to be able to walk in the divine health for, for eternity. It doesn't mean that things aren't gonna come against you. I'm, I'm here to tell you things come against me all the time, but what are you doing with it? Are you receiving it? Are you standing in that grace that, that God's placed within you saying, no, devil, I don't care. I don't care what you say. I don't care what the doctors say. I don't care what I feel. For surely, surely, surely. God, thank you, Jesus, that you have carried our, our sicknesses and you our sicknesses and you've carried our sorrows and we did esteem you stricken smitten and afflicted of God yet and you were wounded for my transgressions Lord. you were bruised for my iniquity that, that my chastisement was, was upon you that by each and every stripe you took on your back you made provision for me to walk in divine health so I can be a witness unto the world. I can be a witness unto the land of, of who you are in me and who I am in you. So he said, take and eat. This is my body. This is the representation of what, was, what has taken place on that cross. This is the time to, to thank God and to receive everything that he has already prepared for you. So he already knows what you need. But you're going to have to allow it to come forth out of you. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you for, for your provision and we thank you for your obedience, Jesus. For willingly taking our punishment, willingly taking our pain, willingly taking our sickness and disease, willingly taking our poverty and our curse, willingly taking our iniquity. Lord, that we can be the children of the Most High God. 
Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name. After he ate, he had this cup that he passed around. He said, this is the New Testament in my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. He said, do this as, do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this covenant. We thank you for the covenant that was made in your blood, Lord, that it was signed, that it was sealed, and it was delivered by your choice, that you loved us so much that you came down here for us. And not only did you shed your own blood for us, Lord, but you you took our rightful place in, in the pit of hell, Lord. I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the covenant you've made with us, Lord, making all provision, making all things that you have available unto us. And Jesus, we commit ourselves unto you today, saying that all that we have, the greatest thing we have, we offer unto you. We give you ourselves. We give you our words. We give you our desires. We give you every single thing that you've placed in our hands. Thanking you, Lord, for the blood. Thanking you, Lord, for the temple you've made us. Lord, thanking you for the witnesses that you've made us. And so we glorify you this day. In Jesus' name. Church, just lift up your hands. Just lift your hands up and receive. Just lift up your hands and receive what, what, you're, what you're believing God for. I'm telling because there's healing in this house. There's provision in this house. Grab a hold of it by faith. Grab a hold of it because God says it's yours. God said in his word that it's yours. Hmm. Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your healing's being poured out upon your people. I thank you that their financial needs are being met, Lord. I, I thank you, Lord, that they're getting tuned in to your frequency, being able to receive, being able to hear, being able to grab a hold of the very thing that's grabbed a hold of them. Jesus, I thank you that you make yourself a reality in people's lives. Lord, we thank you. We glorify you for it. Father, I thank you as we draw this meeting to a close, Lord, I thank you. And we stand on your word, Lord. For we trust in your word, we trust in your provision that no evil shall befall us, neither shall any plague come nigh our dwelling place. Lord, that you give your angels charge over us, Lord. We, we release those angels in the name of Jesus to provide us for our protection, to, to provide us for you know our, the provision that you've already laid out for us. We release that in the name of Jesus, thanking you, Lord. Thanking you for your caring, thanking you for your mercy, and thanking you for the, the measure of faith that you've placed upon each and every one of us, Lord, to, to believe and receive anything that you've placed on the inside of us, anything that the Word says that we can have. We thank you as we go out and perform the righteous labor of our hands, Lord, that we are that we are protected, Lord, that we are a blessing to 
to our companies. We're a blessing to our bosses. We are a blessing to our employees. We thank you, Lord. For just as much as the adversary has a target on our back, Lord, we thank you that we make his life miserable here. That we are a problem to the adversary. That we show forth your victory. We show forth your kingdom in everything we do. Lord, and I thank you that we're a miracle in somebody's lives. Lord, I thank you for a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge to come at the right time. Lord, I thank you for that life is being brought forth in our prayers, Lord, that, that your healing anointing flows not only into us, Lord, but it flows into all the people. you've called us to be, Lord, thanking you, Lord, here at that island church, we are covered by the blood, we're empowered by your word, and then we're anointed by the Holy Ghost, amen.